Welcome to the Violin Podcast, where we interview violinists from around the world. I'm your host, Eric Magala. If you're new to the podcast, please be sure to hit the subscribe button. That way you get notified for when new episodes come out. My guest today is a violinist based in North London. He's performed around the UK and internationally. He's taught for a number of universities and is the host of the Jazz Violin Podcast. Please give me a warm welcome to Matt Holborn. Matt, good to meet you. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'm fine. Just... Uh... Just doing away, you know. Try to uh, keep keep busy, but not too busy during the during these troubling times. Truckling, yeah. uh, trucking along. Um, are you are you folks still yeah. on lockdown in London? Yeah, we're on super lockdown. We're on super Goodness. lockdown number three. Yeah, number three. Yeah, yeah. wow. Well, as as of this like, episode, yeah. As of this episode, we had yeah we had like number one, which everyone, it was sort of coincided with a lot of people's all around the world. Then we had number. Well, I guess it, we didn't really have a number two. We had like a moment where, where the government were like, hey, you know, best to stay inside for a bit. And then it suddenly got really bad, as everyone I'm sure who's listening has uh, read in the news. The UK completely stacked it, basically. And, uh, and we, we, we're, now, uh, we're now losing the battle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, let's hope that this new variant um, gets under control. But I mean, I mean, what else can you do at this point, right? Um, yeah, not so much. You can just stay at home and uh, and hope for, hope for the best. Hope and, for the best. You know, try and stay positive. Let's just yeah. let's just hope the variant stays under control in the U.S. At least, um, there, there the variant is popping yeah. up, especially where I am in uh, Massachusetts and California and so on and so forth. Okay. But, anyways. Enough about COVID talk. I want to talk violin with you because <laughs> you're the host of the Jazz Violin Podcast. And I'm the host of the Violin Podcast, so it's really nice to be able <laughs> to talk to like another. Cla well, not not classical music, but another music podcaster that specializes in talking with violinists. But for those of you who are not familiar with Matt, who is Matt Holborn um, in a nutshell? Well, I am a, I, I guess I'm a jazz violinist. Uh, that's that, and that's what I've mainly focused my my life and my just my, I, I guess my career on. Uh, through, yeah, from from the age of maybe 17 or maybe uh, probably 20, let's say. I don't think I was focused when I was 17. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm a jazz violinist. I'm not really a classical violinist. I did do a little bit of classical music when I was a kid. I did a little bit of, I did lessons in the school. And then I had a private teacher when I was in high school. And yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, really, a, not really a classical violinist to you know I, I wouldn't pay me to be a classical violinist right anyway. right yeah which is why i wanted to talk to you because you are a jazz violinist you have this really cool patreon group um the jazz violin club so i definitely want to talk to you about that and you know something a uh, topic that i'm really interested in to help the listeners is music business you know we're going through some really strange times and musicians musicians are trying to figure out ways to produce uh an income revenue so i'd love to get your yeah. thoughts on um setting up a successful patreon later on but yeah yeah and uh, again the focus of violin podcast not just about classical even though i have a lot of classical music friends i want to make sure i make sure. some new friends out um yeah out, <laughs> out of the classical medium but uh so you say between 17 and 20 you're dipping your feet into jazz or um yeah, I mean, I can tell you my, uh, you know, my journey into jazz violin if you want. Please do. Yeah, I think if that you can handle it. I, <laughs> hey man, we still got a long ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, I basically did. Ooh, I'm peeking. Uh, I I basically did a bit of stuff at school as a violinist, and then, you know, when I was a kid, I wasn't that. Um, I was a real bad student. I wasn't a very good student in terms of, well, in, with anything I did, I wasn't very focused. I was just a normal teenager. I'm sure that most of us know what that's like being a teenager. I was like a teenager of 101. I was a proper teenager. I just didn't care. And I just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't very focused. But then when I did get to, um, when I got to the, around the age of 17, I suddenly started listening to music in a different way. And I, and I, and I, uh, I had a, I had a grandfather, my grandfather is a jazz clarinetist. And I remember he played me the music of Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli. I don't know, you know, maybe people aren't aware of who those musicians are, but Django Reinhardt was a gypsy, uh, 
a, a, a Belgian gypsy who lived in Paris in the 20s, 30s, 40s. And he, uh, he, he, he loved jazz. He also, you know, he came from playing like gypsy music or different, different types of um, like manouche music. But he uh, he he got in, he got really into jazz, and then he just started saying. Well, he was like, well, you know what? And he got really into Eddie Lang, and all that stuff, all that old old. Well, no, it wasn't old jazz back then. All that jazz, and he then started to play it in, in his own way, and that sort of. And he had this violinist, Stefan Grappelli, who was you know he's one of the main jazz violinists, really. Like the the people that one of these musicians that everyone thinks of when they think of that genre or that style, they think of Grappelli. I would say and the same. Any, yeah, I mean Stefan Grappelli yeah. is super well known. Um, there is this very famous video of um, who was it? it was Stefan Grappelli and uh, one of the violins who uh, who just passed away. Um, God, yeah, Lockwood. No, for some reason I, I can't think of. My gosh, I'll, Sven, I'll have to search it up. Sven Asmussen. Sven Asmussen. I'll, 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 I'll search it for, for um, I'll search it within the next few minutes while you're talking. But <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt okay. you, but yeah, Stefan Grappelli. Yeah. Totally. Um, total, like a total icon yeah. in jazz violin. Yeah. Well, I basically heard that my grandfather played me the records that they made in like the thirties and forties. And he told me the story of, you know, that story. And he also told me the story of Django. Django only had like two working fingers. The other two like were, 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 were damaged in a fire. And they were sort of like welded together. Anyway, uh, he took my grandfather told me that story, and I remember taking the music back home and being like, you know, taking the the record back home and listening. And and I got, I remember getting the story wrong. I remember thinking that Grappelli had to, only had two fingers, and I remember just thinking like, what is going on? How can this guy play so well with only two fingers? And I remember it really actually sort of disheartening me. I remember listening and thinking, you know, I could, I could never do that. I don't really know what's going on. You know, I looked for some sheet music and the sheet music didn't really help. And I think it was, you know, it was through time. And, you know, my grandfather then started teaching me a little bit about playing blues. And he taught me that on the guitar because he's also a guitarist. And I remember practicing playing blues on guitar and thinking, you know, like, actually, this is great. I'm enjoying improvising. So that was like my for first foray into improvising. But I remember thinking, you know, actually, I'm doing this on the guitar. I can't really play the guitar. I actually played the violin quite well. Why don't I just try and move everything I'm doing onto the violin? And it sort of started from there. That was sort of, that was around when I was like 16, 17. And then I went and studied on a jazz course after a couple of years of, well, after a good number of years of, of just practicing and getting lessons with different musicians, people like Tim Griffiths. I went, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I enrolled in a jazz course, basically studying, uh, studying jazz as a as first studied violinist in leeds leeds college of music uh yeah and from there it's just been i'm just i'm just it turns out i'm i'm obsessed you know i'm i'm, I'm an obsessive i can't really stop thinking about it all the time i still haven't it's been god knows how long 20 years and i'm i'm still obsessed i'm still waking mm. up thinking about jazz violin every day that's great and yeah that's that's sort of my first that's where I, that's how i got into it anyway that's awesome. Uh, by the way, for the audience, it's Ivory Gitlis. There's that famous video of Ivory Gitlis, classical violinist, working with um, Stefan Grappelli. I think it was an improv jazz session, and uh, he passed away recently at the age of 98. But um, anyhow, but yeah, let's. Okay, um, I, I've never. I don't think I've ever seen that actually. You know what yeah. you should check out in, along those along that same vein mm -hmm. is uh, a, a protege of. Grappelli, Didier Lockwood, who's also, that's who I thought you were talking about, actually, he mm -hmm. passed away recently. There's a great, there's some, there's a great, great footage of Didier Lockwood. He's this amazing French jazz violinist teaching Maxim Vengerov. So I'm, I'm imagining, you know. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't imagine Maxim Vengerov so, playing some jazz violin. But yeah, please well, send that over. So that we having a great time. So yeah, send that over so I can put that in the podcast, uh, podcast notes. That'll be really interesting for the, for the listeners to watch. But yeah, you know, music is such a funny affair, isn't it? Because sometimes, you know, like for you, you wake up thinking about music every day. I feel the same way. Um, and sometimes people are thinking like, wait, do you think about other things? I mean, well, yes, but like, but that's, this is something that, you know, is our livelihood. This is something of a, of a lifestyle for us. What is a lifestyle yeah. like for, for a jazz violinist? Because I know for classical musicians, we're, we're really like, 
uh, structured like, okay, there's a call time and there's, you know, we have to play in an orchestra. Everything needs to be kind of organized. The music on the page is very like, we need to obey what's on the page. Um, and I know that jazz violin can be different. Can you talk about um, the creative process in jazz violin? Yeah, so I guess the difference between our lifestyles is exactly what you've said is in you we we're in an even more of a sort of gig we've got even more of a sort of gig economy thing going on as jazz musicians often unless you're you know you're in a, a outfit that's touring the same gig you know the same band small band that's touring the world every you know all, all year but not many people are in that situation but most you know jazz musicians are they we we sort of live or work and and yeah w live and work gig to gig as in we you get called for so many different things and you know one it's one of the reasons I live in London is that there's so many well not at the moment but they're, they're, the great thing about London is there are so many venues that that are putting on jazz gigs every night you know you can go you you just Google, you know, whatever you want to see and you'll be able to see it at least, you know, even if it's the weirdest thing ever, you'll be able to go and see that music at some point that week or whatever, you know. So there's lots of gigs going on around London and then there's lots of probably, you know, it'll be similar to what some people do. I guess if you work, if you work in classical music and you work in like quartet stuff and you go, you go around doing small venues around the country, do tours like that. I mean, I, I've spent, I, you know, I've spent a lot of years doing rural tours where you go around and you just go to yeah, little, little village halls and you play for people who don't often get music going on, uh, in, in their, uh, in their town doing things like that. Then, you know, it's, it's everything from gigs around town, tours, rural tours to, you know, random one off, uh, sort of big projects that happen once in a while, you know, doing things with, I mean, I've done a couple of things with, with like some of the, some of the orchestras in, in London, but not as not, I'm not, I've never been really there as an orchestral player. I've been there as part of a, a jazz collective sort of doing a big, uh, a sort of big mashup of, of, of things. We did, uh, we did a lot of, um, a lot of the Duke Ellington suites and Duke Ellington orchestral arrangements uh, at the at the Queen Elizabeth Hall last year, and you know it, it's probably you know I don't think it's that different to how how you guys work, but I think that we don't we are gig to gig, and and that's how we learn as well. We for me, I learn all about jazz at home, practicing lots and lots and lots. Uh, studied at college had lots of lessons but you don't learn how it works until you're on a gig every night or every two nights you're in a different gig with a different band someone's like hey do you know this tune and you're like ah oh, god you know i know the sound of that tune why don't you play it i'll uh you know and i'll hear it and i'll try and work out what the chords are whilst you're playing it we have a lot of that so i that i guess that's a bit different to, to how you guys work right you there's never a point with for, for, for classical musicians where they're like, Hey guys, have you got the music? Nah. Okay. Well, maybe you'll find cool. See you soon. One, two, three, yeah. four. That doesn't happen. That, I think that annoys us the most. It's like, wait, you're giving us music the day of what is this nonsense? Oh, right. But, <laughs> but I, yeah, well, that, that, that's why I totally to be honest, it would do the same for me. Yeah. I mean, that's why I totally appreciate. If I was to have to read, I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. You know, that's why I appreciate, uh, you know, violin it's outside the classical music realm just because you know in, in the jazz in the jazz world you know you go to a gig um the the most recent example that i've come across is just like watching the movie soul by disney pixar you know disney uh it's it's about a music educator who just gets this gig and wants to uh you know become a performer outside of music education and then you know you show up to the gig and you, ju you just start playing right you don't kind of don't know what to expect i think yeah. that's the uh, that's the thrill of it. I had a I had a bass player on my other podcast, an everyday musician, um, who lives in New York, and just like London, you know, New York is kind of like this this hub of jazz clubs and jazz music. Um, I'm sure there are a few jazz clubs that you can recommend in London that you enjoy playing or in or that you enjoy going to. Are there a few that you like? 
Well, there's the obvious Ronnie Scotts, which is a, a, a total one of the sort of main it's like london's main jazz uh jazz venue for the lockdown the, one of the places that i played a lot and went to see gigs a lot was a place called the kansas smitties but that's closed down now i think i think they've closed i don't know what they're doing when they when things come back up they've actually closed down their venue and they're they're doing live streaming from a different venue but we're not sure whether they're going to carry on Kansas Smitties, there's places like the Vortex, which is a great place to, to go and see sort of more experimental and more sort of forward thinking jazz. There is, God, but you know what? What's a great place? The Green Note, which I hope is going to stay going, stay, stay alive. That's a great place for every, a lot of different types of music, folk music, jazz, different types of music from around the world. Um, yeah, those are some off the top of my head. Right. And, you know, you've shed some light on the, you know, the recent lockdown. You're currently in lockdown as the release of this episode. You are in lockdown. How yeah. have you been able to um, adapt as a, as, a, as a musician out in London? Because I think you're the first international guest that I've had on the podcast outside the U.S. And it's kind of good and it's kind of great to get a different perspective outside the country. So what have you observed? What are some of the things that you've noticed um, during this time? Uh, well, I, what I've noticed, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I've noticed a lot of things. What I have noticed is everybody's really stressed and everybody's sort of basically doing things. Well, I, maybe I'm just talking about myself, but you know, I, what I'm noticing is everybody is, is fine. You know, everything, any problem that would have ever been there before is like magnified by at least double, you know, I think that if you're if you're someone who struggles with your mental health or if you're someone who struggles with bouts of anxiety they're going to get they've, they've like everybody i know who's had that or has that it's it's got worse for sure uh and that yeah i mean i don't know it, it, it's all you know that's those are the negatives for musicians i think that it's been difficult because i don't know what it's like in the u.s but at the the first moment when it all started kicking off, like I, I, I don't want to sound like I, uh, I don't care about it, but I remember most of us as musicians were like, actually great because I was just running around. All I was doing was like getting in, getting in a, on a tour bus or getting on a plane or getting in a crammed car and going all over the place. Or I was running around town and and there was a bit of a a moment of like ah you know this is actually quite nice to have some time to chill and you look at the news and you're like okay maybe i'm not that chilled and actually what am i gonna do but I, you know there was a really in general that first couple of months was was sort of okay for musicians and i was i was just like yeah i'm gonna practice i'm gonna get the chance to i was saying i wanted to have some more time to practice and now i've got it great you know and i enjoyed that but i think the when when i i actually think the most difficult parts for musicians is when everything has started to open a little bit and there are starting the things are just starting to come back and actually everybody else has sort of gone back to work or they're sort of living a bit of a more normal life that's like when i say everybody else i mean non-musicians and seeing you know people who seeing non-musicians sort of basically forgetting about it and being like oh you know out in the pub and thinking you know maybe you know coronavirus but like you know my life's sort of back to normal i still go into the office once in a while but for musicians, most of us, that we, we, we haven't gone back to the office. We haven't gone back to anything. Maybe some of us have start, started doing a couple of things and they all got cancelled again. And I think that's been the most difficult part for, for me, actually, the, the, uh, the times when we're in the middle. You know, I actually mind the black and white that when, when we're in lockdown, I'm like, OK, we're all in lockdown. We're not allowed to leave. But when it's like, uh, you know, when, it, when we're in the middle, I think that's the most difficult part for for the musicians that's what i'd say uh yeah, yeah. I, I i i would say similarly in the us at least for me um you know i do a lot of i do a lot of teaching and i'm in the car teaching from place to place um you know not so much performing as of you know the coronavirus but a lot of a lot of concerts of mine got canceled um but yeah, yeah. I, I did have that i did have that same feeling where i was like yeah, you know, I finally get to spend some time with my wife, right? <laughs> and I get to, yeah, yeah. you know, I get to kind of um, be at, be at home. But then, I think uh, the kind of the reality, as you said, like there was a tease of like, oh, you know, I think we can finally reopen. Then they're like, oh, no, scratch that, we're gonna close again. Yeah. Um, 
I think there's that constant struggle um, in in the U.S. at least where you know halls are trying to stay alive, but they're it's very difficult. I mean, a lot of like major orchestras and musicians or whatnot are relying on creative ways to you know stay alive or even leave the music profession altogether, which is a really sad thing to even talk about. Which you know hopefully um, we don't have to get there, but. Right now, I think it's been, yeah, I, th I think you like you said it really well. It's everything's kind of been like amplified, you know. Any, anybody yeah. who's struggling already has just completely amplified that. But you managed yeah. to, but, but you managed to uh, create create some very interesting outlets of income revenue outside of your gig platforms. You know, you have the Jazz Violin Podcast, and obviously you have uh, the Patreon group, which is what I kind of want to transition into because that yeah. uh, for people who are not familiar with Patreon, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, uh, for, for my U.S. citizen colleagues, it's kind of like a PBS kind of thing where, you know, you donate for the cause um, and what you believe in, right? So let's say if somebody wants to get Jazz Violin, lessons or you have what you say is a jazz violin group then people can pay a monthly membership just to be in this group and they get access to videos and it's kind of like a subscription service like netflix or or something else uh talk about how that uh how that came about what what's what sparked the idea of having a jazz violin practice group well it came about through it was really really it was quite, it, it was, it just, it was very, uh, organic. I basically one day was practicing and I was also, I also was aware, I was practicing on my own and I was aware that a lot of people were finding it difficult to practice at the moment. And I was also realizing that actually a lot of, I've got a lot of really great classical violin friends or just like violin friends or even jazz violin friends who, who always say to me, Oh God, you know, I don't know how you practice. You know, I find it so hard to practice because Practicing jazz is a is a, it can be quite it can be quite difficult to know what to do. It's it's a much younger art form than well than a lot of the art forms that that we're that we that we have in our life. You know, it's a lot it's a lot younger than than uh, Western classical music. It's a it's a hell of a lot younger than like Indian classical music or anything else. And there's actually not really a there's not as many. Uh, uh, it's not as set out for you uh, as, you know, with classical, if you're a classical violinist, you've got these different schools of playing, you know, and schools of teaching and different yeah, it's a, it's a lot of tradition, pedagogical, a lot of tradition. There's mm. lots of tradition. And of course there is tradition with jazz, but it's a lot younger. And I think that it can be quite difficult to know what to do. It hasn't been formalized. And I think that's great in a lot of ways. But anyway, I know a lot of people who love playing jazz or really want to play jazz, but who were like, I don't really know how to practice. So I thought what what I would do was I would take people through exercises that I sort of like to do, that like scale exercises that will sort of take you off the page. Because I know that as classical as a classical viol as a classical musician, you're often you, you know you'll often learn scales basically as a as like an exercise to to show to your teacher to show them that you practice. I'm just talking about and I you know when I was getting my sort of you know less sure your classical kids, training yeah. back way back yeah, when yeah 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 you know you 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 look at scales in a way as as exercises as things to show that you've practiced that's what i always noticed and jazz musicians we we use scales in a different way we use scales as a way to sort of build our own language of jazz and our own improvisational language and there's, I have loads of different like concepts. So just things that I've ended up practicing, you know, things that I've noticed from jazz that I've put into exercises that are very repetitive. They go up and down the, the violin, up and down the scale. They, they, you know, looking at the scale in as many different ways as possible, i.e. looking at all the chords you can find out of a scale, looking at all of the, uh, the way that you can treat each note. You know, you can give each note a, uh, like a, you can give each. I always forget this word, and I and I, I've got bad. I've got bad memory, man. Uh, what's the word? Enclosures. Enclosures. There you go. Note enclosures. <laughs> Closing notes in in interesting ways to to sort of create tension and release when you're you know when when you're creating lines. And anyway, I have all these things that I, that I was doing, and actually I realized because I'd been in India, man. I'm, this is a long one. I'm sorry. 
I, I can talk for for years. I've had a lot of coffee, but hey, anyway, better it's, uh, better content, man. That's it's you know you know you know you're a podcaster. You know what it's like. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd been in India just before because I'm really into Indian classical music, and as I was taught, you know, as I said, we don't like Indian classical music is super old, and they have these they've they've in a very mathematical way come up with ways that you can you know that you practice to get to the point that you can improvise because that's sort of what Indian classical music is all about it's an improvised art form but they've got all these great scale exercises that that you sort of that are sort of you build upon yourself you work them out yourself but you're taught them by your teacher in, in, in a lot of ways and they're all very they're all very sequential they go up the scale and they go down the scale in different uh, different different orders you know different note orders right up and down the scale and I thought it was a great a, a like this great thing that really helped me understand the music a lot better when I went to India. And I also saw that what you, what people will do as well is they'll practice with their teacher. So rather than their teacher, they, you know, you know, the teacher will, will teach them lessons and tell them to practice on their own. But also what the teacher will do is they will practice with, with the student for hours. You know, they'll do these, this, these scale sessions where they'll practice the scale up and down in all the different ways you possibly can. And, you know, and they'll push the student as far as they can possibly be pushed. And, and then they'll, you know, and they'll stop. And that might last like two hours, just pressing the scale over and over again, you and your teacher. And it's, and it's really, really positive. I remember just thinking, this is so positive. I feel like I'm, I feel like I know what to practice on my own because I've just seen what I'm supposed to practice. I've been in there and I'm also getting the chance to play with this person that I really admire. So I really enjoyed that. Anyway, but it's, I, I do, I do want to point out one thing. It's kind of like you learn by doing. You know, you learn uh -huh, with your yeah. mentor, you know, and I think a yeah. lot of um, I guess that's the main difference between classical music, because it's kind of like sometimes it's very one directional teaching and it's not very much a conversation yeah. where it's kind of hopping back and forth. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, but yeah, that yeah. Karnak, the Karnak tradition, I um, I had a recent um, guest right before you. His name is um, uh, Leith Sadith, and he is uh, Arabic music arabic violence so he talked about like ah. microtones and um you know what's yeah. a c what's a c double sharp kind of thing <laughs> and uh, oh, right yeah yeah, yeah yeah so those yeah. those exist um but yeah they do they totally do so how long um yeah. how long before um how long ago were you in india to to study D this time last year ah. so i just right at the beat just before everything happened so i'm lucky i got back i just finished my point because it that that I, I had come back from India and I was and I'd really enjoyed like learning in that way and I felt like I'd got a lot out of it and I had started to put together some ideas for how I could do that with jazz because I felt like it did work there was there was there was there are things that I could take from the Indian style of teaching and put it into into sort of jazz scale practice and I was just doing that on my own not even thinking like hey you know I would I would ever I would ever start as a a session any sessions doing that but then anyway this whole thing happened i was like hey why don't i just see who's like who's like bored and wants to practice with me because i'll just go on zoom and i'll say hey guys today i'm just i'm thinking we could do this we're going to go up this up the g major scale from the bottom of first position to the top of first position and we're going to uh, we're going to uh, treat each note we're going to go to each note by a semitone below etc etc and i just thought i'll do that and then there was like 40 people on this on this thing a lot of people were like, yeah, let's do it. There was 40 people on my Zoom. And I was like, okay, cool. I, you know what I'll do is I'll start a Facebook group for people who want to come and do this. Like, because I'm, I, you know, I thought I'll just do this. I could do this pretty much every day. This is the first lockdown. So I can do this pretty much every day. And so actually, you know, I'll, actually I'll do it every two days. So I did three times a week I, in the morning at 10 a.m. I was like, hey guys, come practice with me, whatever. It was always really, really busy. And I was like, I started doing, uh, I started asking for donations, saying, hey, if you want to donate, you're more than welcome. And then suddenly I actually had this, just out of, out of that, I just had this revenue stream. And it's like, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't like killing it. And not every, that was the nice thing about, uh, about it. I wasn't, you know, it was just like, if you can afford to, and you've got the money, you're more than welcome to give me a small donation. And if you can't, please just keep coming, whatever. It's all good. And, and I did, and it did, but it did become a, 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 a sort of a, a revenue stream. And I actually thought, you know, why don't I, why don't I see if there's, if there's, if, if going ahead, I can turn this into a subscription thing. So, you, you know, you, you join if, 
you join the subs- you, you know you join me on patreon if you uh yeah if, if if you've liked it and you want to carry it on and, and it's a bit like a yoga class it's not like you come to my sessions having to having had you don't have to practice in the in the meantime so it that's the whole idea it's a practice session these are practice sessions it's a practice club so we're you know if, if you don't have time to practice you don't like practicing or you find practicing hard especially with jazz you come to the practice club you do you know we basically do about two hours uh, once a week and you've done two hours practice once a week and you've you know you've you've worked on some stuff that you wouldn't have worked on and that's the idea and as, and, and as i was going sorry i've been talking a lot but, that's that's uh, fine um i do want to point out though it's kind of like you're like a practice officiator where you're not like yeah i mean you're you're not you're not saying oh do this you're not like the teacher you're like okay let's just try this and well so that's what it of? started as in with it was like hey why don't why don't we do this as a collaborative thing that's the thing i started it thinking that maybe i could you know we could do but actually at the end of the what i realized was not everybody wants to do that not everyone wants to lead the group or not everyone it's not everyone's thing and i was like having a great time leading the group i'd never run i mean i'd you know i still haven't run out of ideas for what we practice it's, it's always new it's always something slightly different and it's always challenging so i don't know i i realized that it was it is it was best that i yeah i'm sort of i am facilitating practice but i am also leading it i guess that's the thing it is it is it start but it did start off with me trying to make it collaborative i think like i don't know if you've done that before but I, I, you you must know this as someone who's who's got your own stuff going on you know it, it's often these the collaborative things don't they're not going to work as well because you are the one that wants it the most because it's your thing you know then I, I think that was I also think that's like an entrepreneurial mindset too, which is, which is a topic that we talked about a lot on the podcast, you know, clearly, you know, with your jazz violin podcast and your jazz practice, where we have like a, you have an idea, you have an image of what it's supposed to be like, and, and then it kind of evolves from there, um, which is a great segue yeah. into the jazz violin podcast is the, the, the jazz oh, yeah. violin podcast. And I think the jazz violin podcast, from what I've read and what I've noticed, it came before the practice group. Am I right? Or oh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They came before, yeah, I've been right? doing it. I think I've been doing it for like three years. Yeah, talk talk about the Jazz Violin podcast and your experience. So I, you know, it's a real, man, I just was like, I really like podcasts. I love listening to podcasts and I want to hear some interviews with these musicians because I, I, you know, as a jazz violinist, you, it can, as I've said, it can be difficult to, to, uh, there's no set, certainly, you know, there's not much of a set path for jazz musicians to, to start and end as a jazz musician. It's not as, it's not as rigorous or as, there's not as much, there's not as long a tradition as in classical music. So there's, it's, and, and as a jazz violinist, you're, you're, you're even, you've got even less because jazz violin is so, so niche, man. It's like the nichest thing and one of the nichest things you could possibly uh you could possibly think about if you think about it in comparison to everything else in the world you know it's so niche and there's just not many there's just not much stuff out there or there wasn't much stuff out there when i was when i started and i thought well i just want to hear interviews with all these all these musicians the first person i wanted to interview was cha limberger who is literally one of the best musicians you will ever come across he is an absolute genius uh, so check check him out. That's my first episode, and I, you know, I remember just thinking, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to interview jazz violinists. You know, I remember thinking first of all, you know, when they come to London, I'll interview them then. Uh, and I, and it actually, because London, such a hub for music, it, you know, it worked out quite well for the first couple of years. Obviously, just doing just doing it when people were around, or doing it when I was around near them. And it just took on a life of its own. It's sort of, it, it ended up, it's, I mean, I don't, it's quite hard to know how well it does, but I think it does okay. And I, I've, en- you know, I've ended up, I ended up just interviewing all the, all the people, all the people who, 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 who I wanted to, which was great. I, I didn't think that was ever going to happen when I started it. I thought it would be a lot more niche. It would be people who I, you know, who maybe who I knew or who I'd played with in on the circuit on the jazz violin or the or the sort of Django circuit. I thought it was just going to be that, but I ended up interviewing uh, 
John Luke Ponty at, at the end of it, and well, not the end of it. Sorry, I'm still still doing them, but you know that was a real moment where I was like, oh wow, because John Luke Ponty is like the godfather of modern jazz violin, and I was just interviewing him, and I was like, what? How did this happen? This is mental. This is crazy. But you know, it's just that's how it is. I I I just really uh, I just wanted to I just wanted to hear the interviews myself, and I, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, I started the violin podcast during the pandemic, like in March, um, oh, cool. you know, having had some experience with the Everyday Musician podcast where I interview local musicians doing amazing things, because I think that oftentimes we have a chance to see, like, like you said, like people on in the circuit, like in the A-list group of musicians that everybody kind of already talks about. But you know, mm. often the little guys, the local, the local musicians who are making a huge impact are also really important. So that's what that purpose of that podcast was. But for the violin podcast, I wanted to use like as a resource, kind of like you, where I can kind of look back on. I'm like, oh, I had this really interesting conversation and I learned this from that person. And yeah. um, do, do you find that to, to be the same or different? Yeah, totally, totally. Um I, yeah, I mean, that was the reason I, one of the reasons I started it was, it was like, I actually just want to hear these interviews. I think it's going to be great for me to, to get the chance to ask these people, these questions, because these are questions that, you know, and there'll be questions that, that are really silly little things. It's just like, oh, do you like, you know, what do you prefer first position or third, you know, all this stuff <laughs> yeah. that you wonder when you hear, or, you know, oh, why don't you play in second position often? you know when blah 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 all this stuff that like that you can't really you're never going to find out unless you unless you ask and yeah i think that now it, it i do sometimes listen back and i man i, I hate listening to myself that's one thing oh it's the I, same I, way it's kind of like listening to yourself yeah. after a recording yeah like when you when you're playing when you're playing your violin you listen back like oh okay maybe i'll put that in your archives and i'll listen back maybe five years from now but yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, think... it's it's it is terrible listening to yourself, but it's not. You know, it's been really. I I have, I have delved back into it a couple of times and listened and thought, that's great. I you know that's great advice. And often I'll come away from, from an interview feeling really, uh, with some with having heard them say something that really lifts me up. You know, something new that I've never heard like an idea, a practice idea, or, you know, a way of looking at music. And I'll usually come away from, from interviews just feeling great. You know, that's, yeah. And I, and I hope you feel the same way about this one. I definitely do. Um, <laughs> uh, well, but the problem with this one is I'm just talking about myself. So then I'm probably going to go away thinking, oh God, what did you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Matt, before, before we head out, um, what are what are some quick tips that you can offer for anyone who's interested in jazz violin, a, apart from you know just encouraging them to join your practice group? Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, please join my practice. But no, uh, it's about listening. You know, it's about listening, and the there's you know yeah, it's about listening to the music as much as you can. So there's all this theory stuff that you can you can work on, and there's all of these exercises that you can do and there's you know you can you can do things but you but you won't get the sound of jazz into your playing unless you you listen and you really really want it to happen and it has to become a little obsession it doesn't have to become a massive obsession i mean it's pro you know I, I imagine right now people listening to this are violinists and those violinists will know that obsession that thing that hits you push when you're like when you're maybe when you were first trying to really get your technique up or when you were really first trying to you know get your maybe your first like really difficult concerto down where you're just obsessed with that concerto and you cannot do anything but but want but make that better you can't think about anything else or it's always on your mind now the thing is i guess my advice is yeah you need to get to that space in some way to some degree and for me, what I find, and I, this is me, I, I've spent a lot of time working on lots of different styles. Because like you said, I've gone to India. I've spent a lot of time looking at Eastern European folk and Romani folk, Gypsy folk. Uh, and, I, and, and, it, and I only ever really get, get anywhere 
when I when I get obsessed with it. And it doesn't always have to be the only thing in your life, but you know, one of the things that really helps me, and it's been helping me over lockdown, lockdown three, lockdown number three, is the first thing I do when I wake up is I put on some music and I put on some music. Actually, what I'll often do, I'm, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm not a very heavy sleeper. I'll wake up at night. So I'll wake up at like seven or six or seven and I'll just put some music on, put it in my ears and lie back, lie back and just listen to some music for about like an hour. Maybe I'll fall asleep. Maybe I'll come back. And I think that that is, that is, the main thing that I would do if, you know, as, as well, you know, before, before even worrying too much about, um, about anything technical, just listening to it and, and listening as much as you can. And, and, and the more you listen, the more you'll think to yourself, Hey, well, how do I do that? I really want to go and do that. I, I want to make that happen on my instrument and the rest will come and you'll find the rest yourself. You'll either you know, you'll either you'll either find videos and lessons online or you'll even just, you know, you'll be using your ear and you'll be trying to pick up what people are doing by ear and learning, learning the sort of lines as much as you can by ear. That is the main thing for me. That's my advice to anyone who wants to learn a new style, I guess. That's that's what I would say. You know, I, there's other technical things that I could say that, you know, well, you should first of all learn your scales and blah, blah, blah. And I can say that if you want, but the first thing has to be just like being super excited, <laughs> you know? Yeah, to be inspired. And just by listening and having this conversation with you, Matt, you seem to be a very thoughtful person. Like you've thought about these things um, in, in your practice yeah. group. And just by, I'm, get, I'm getting like a very creative vibe. And I, I feel like um, what you said about being in the space that allows you to yeah. be creative, I think is super important. And um, I value that advice. Thank you so much. And I hope the, the listeners really valued that. Uh, Matt, yeah. Thanks so much for the conversation. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, well, you know, I, I, I am all over social media. Every single social media outlet, apart from like Snapchat, you find me on those places. You find me on my website www.mattholborn.com. But that's uh, I'm not very good at updating that. It, there is stuff on there though that that'll take you to a bunch of stuff that I do. You find me on Spotify, man. You can find me everywhere. You can find me everywhere. Yeah. The, the, the more <laughs> everywhere you are, the better. And uh, Matt, thanks so much. Really Sometime. appreciate it. <laughs> Sometimes. I really appreciate the conversation. And if you like this episode of The Violent Podcast, please make sure to hit the subscribe button so that way you get notified for new episodes. And um, also make sure to subscribe to the Jazz Violent Podcast because, you know, Matt is on to really uh, talking to really cool guests. And um, I can I can endorse another violent podcaster in the world. So thanks again so much, Matt. And again, if you haven't subscribed, please do thanks, so. Matt. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.